So I felt like I was on top of the world. I had mastered the minor pentatonic scale all over the fretboard. I could play solos, I could play licks, I could play fairly fast, I could jam with people. And at that point, I thought, honestly, I got it made. I am a good musician and I could pretty much play with anyone. Great, my learning phase of the guitar is over. Now it's just experiencing and that's pretty awesome. I love this. Well, all that changed March 18th, 1999. Honestly, I was a little overconfident and I really need a taste of reality. See, at the time, the only people I had been playing with were my, my buddies, my friends, who picked up an instrument pretty much at the same time I did. We started a band together. I mean, you know how it goes, right? Just fresh out of high school. You got several bands that started at the same time and uh, you all jam together and nothing really challenging. Plus, at the time, everything was new. So if one person had just learned how to tap, then all, all the others would learn at the same time and there was no real challenge. The only challenge you had is seeing your friend do something that you were not able to do and trying to replicate it. And because he's a friend, he'll show you really quick and plus his technique wasn't very good. So nothing super challenging musically. So yeah, I was overconfident, especially on that dreadful night of March 18th, 1999. Now the ad read something like this, instrumental rock band, looking for fast lead guitar player. So I knocked on my door and the audition process would be pretty much straightforward. I didn't have to learn any songs. The guy on the phone just told me, just show up with your guitar. We've got an amp there and we'll just, we'll just jam and see what happens, have a good time. Well, the guys in the room were about 10 years older than me. It was fine. I was kind of used to playing with older people, no problem. But that should have been a clue though, because uh, when they started jamming, it sounded pretty different than the jams that I was used to playing with my buddies. It sounded really good. It sounded uh, kind of rock, but not the garage band rock that I was used to playing. It sounded a lot more sophisticated. And one thing really interesting is that the bass player and the drummer were actually looking at each other and, and just kind of almost like they had these insider jokes, just kind of like, nodding their head and then someone would do something and they, they were really tight and locked into this thing that I, I didn't really comprehend at the time. There was also a keyboard player and uh, the keyboard player didn't have any sheets in front of him, just jamming. Now, what is really interesting is that when Richard, the bass player said, let's jam, all that they needed was a one, two, three, four from the drummer and they were at it. They didn't mention any keys, any, just nothing. They just started playing. So here I was. I didn't want to ask the key and I didn't want to ask uh, the song that they were playing because, uh, well, because I was embarrassed. So what I did is discreetly look at the bass player. I had a good idea of how to kind of translate where the fingers were on the fretboard into ideas. And what I found was that the bass player was gravitating around what looked like an A minor pentatonic. It didn't sound like pentatonic, but it sounded kind of like in the same flavor. It was actually Dorian, but I didn't know that at the time. So great, that's probably a minor pentatonic. I listened and I went for the opening lick. Yeah, that was my opening lick. It seemed to work, but then as I started improvising, I was really all over the place. Uh, I noticed that the keyboard player just kind of popped out of his keyboards, his head, looked at the bass player with a smile, the drummer with a smile, and looked at me, uh, nodding, as in I knew exactly what was going on, and I nodded back. <laughs> and then the drummer played a fill, and uh, there it was. I continued playing, and something was awfully wrong. Uh, now I know that these guys were super nice and they, they didn't make a big deal out of it. They just looked at me and smiled and, you know, as if everything was fine. But I knew uh, at that time that I had completely messed up the audition. So it turned out that, uh, yeah, they changed key on me in the middle of the song. I had no idea. And obviously I was completely lost with my minor pentatonic scale. The rest of the song was pretty much a disaster. <laughs> I. 
I actually pretending that I had a problem with my guitar and that the jack came loose and like what's going on messed with my amp and they, they knew. <laughs> Anyways, I went back home that night, kind of discouraged, but also kind of excited because I had found something that I had no idea about. And I knew at that point that uh, I had not made it as a, as a guitar player. As a matter of fact, I was way behind and I got to work the next day. Now at the time, we didn't have everything that we have today as far as guitar education. I couldn't go on YouTube, it didn't exist at the time to, to find out what was going on. So I went to my local library and went into the music section and uh, started reading about theory and harmony and, and jazz and all those things. And this led me to, uh, a path of discovery that was very confusing. I started learning about modes and didn't make any sense at all, but kind of triggered a thought that, well, there's more than the minor pentatonic scale, that's great, but how do I get to know which scale to use over this chord? And then most importantly, how do I know uh, without hearing it that there's gonna be a chord change and all that stuff? And it was really difficult. So I decided to enroll in the local music school. They offered jazz guitar lessons. Uh, that was different. <laughs> I learned about these chords that were definitely not power chords. They sounded pretty fancy and I didn't really have a jazz culture and I'm gonna be honest with you, I didn't really like the, the tunes that we learned at the time, but I still went through that because I really liked the music that I heard during my audition with that band. And eventually, after the few fundamental basic lessons with my jazz teacher, I asked him about that experience and he said, well, yeah, that's a modulation. That happens quite a bit. It's a change of key in the same song. And he started explaining to me how to figure out which scale to use when there's a modulation. It made no sense. It was so freaking confusing. A lot of math, a lot of analyzing what was going on, a lot of homework, I, it, was, it was very difficult. And it really didn't bring me anywhere because my experience during that audition uh, was very organic. It was a conversation that was flowing. There was no, uh, you know, looking at the bass player and all right, pause for a second. Let me go out my paper. Let me analyze these chords. No, it was just very organic. So these guys, didn't do it the way that my jazz teacher was teaching me. It was very, very different. So the next day, I picked up the phone, called my jazz teacher, and canceled my lessons. And I decided that I was going to figure out how to do this thing in a different way. So the first thing I did was to think through what happened during that night at the audition. What was involved in that uh, change of key? Well. A lot of it was kind of visual. There were visual cues that told the, the musicians, not me, I was, I was like just watching what was going on, totally messed up the thing, but they were looking at each other. And there were also auditive cues. I remember the drummer built up an in intensity and he did a fill just before that key change. And I also remembered one thing, the keyboard player didn't actually play right on the beat after the drum fill. Why not? Well, I know now that it's because he had to give his ear a chance to hear what was going on and then adjust. It still sounded great because when he played, he just eased in and it, it just made it sound very, um, very much planned. But there was still that, you know, th that little moment of adjustment. He knew something was coming, but he had to listen. So that really told me that the connection, ear, fingers, is essential in that kind of music. And that's exactly what I had to develop in my playing. So this is how I started. I played a note on my keyboard and sustained it so that it would last forever. And then I just played a note on my instrument. Just let that note exist within the context of the chord and, and just ask myself, is this a yes note or a no note? And then I picked another chord, did the same exact thing. Yes, no. The reason for that exercise was just to acclimate to the sound of the notes I was playing over the chords. But then I transitioned to another exercise that really helped me. I started with a chord on the keyboard. I sustained that chord, tried to figure out a scale, and once I was comfortable with the scale, started playing a few melodic lines. And at some point, when my line was finished, I tried to remember 
the sound of the note I landed on and the placement of that note on my fretboard. Then I changed chords on the keyboard. And I recalled the sound and the pitch of the last note I played. And then I asked myself, is this a yes note or a no note? If it was a yes note, I could start playing from that note. If it was a no note, I had learned that typically 99% of the time, if you're landing on a no note, one fret higher is gonna be a yes note. And because I knew the sound of my note and I knew if that note was a yes or a no, I could adjust one fret higher or one fret lower and that would be a yes note. Now you need to realize that that exercise didn't just happen like that. I worked on this for a few months just to get adjusted to fixing my lead and strengthen that connection between what I heard and what I played. Once I was comfortable doing that, once the process got faster and faster, I developed another very simple exercise that really tied things together. Again, I started with a chord that I sustained. I came up with a simple repetitive motif, something like this, for example, three notes. I tried to remember the sound of these notes so that I can sing them internally and remember where these notes were played on the fretboard. Then I changed the chord on my keyboard. Over that new chord, I recalled the sound of that three note motif and note by note, I asked myself, is this a yes or a no? And from there, I could adjust that motif to match the new chord. Now I spent a few weeks on these exercises and the first few days, I didn't really see any, any change, but I kept at it. And what I found is after three weeks of doing this type of exercise, two, three minutes a day, my playing was a lot more in control. It was really surprising. I was able to throw in a backing track and just play without even looking at my fretboard. The notes that I was playing were matching the ideas in my head because all those exercises were helping me strengthen that connection between what I'm hearing and what I'm playing. Now this was back in the late 90s. I refined the process so that it no longer requires a few weeks to acquire this. It only takes three days. And if this sounds like something you wanna do, I created a free three-day challenge that I highly recommend you take. It's right here. This will teach you how to respond to what you hear in your head over modulation. Check it out. It's fun and it's free. I'll see you there.